Sergeants came to us and told us that assassins was coming from New York to uh, assassinate Muhammad Ali for revenge of Malcolm being assassinated. What you come to tell me they're coming to get me for? Why don't you go on the highway and stop them? And there's Liston. I mean, there's this Liston standing there before this entire drama, which I'm sure must have bewildered him as much as it bewildered anyone else. You see, I got them uh, police out there. <laughs> And they got some very vicious dogs. He can come if he want to. But he better have some padded behind. <laughs> By this time, there was so much paranoia over the so-called assassination attempt that as you entered the, uh, the arena, this little hockey rink is what it really was, everyone was searched. This had to be the most chaotic fight of all time. Now you both know the rules of Maine. So I mean, this was like a wrestling match. It was as chaotic as that, and it looked as staged. It really had a stink to it. We note that early, halfway through this first round, that Sonny is shooting mostly, although he's going to the head now, mostly toward that body. You know the old story, you kill the body and the head might follow. Once he was still on the canvas, there were yells of fix from the crowd. Jersey Joe Walcott, the former uh, heavyweight champion in the world, great guy, great fighter, lousy referee. He failed to pick up the uh, timekeeper's count. Liston got up. And finally, um, Nat Fleischer attracted um, Walcott's attention. He said, you know, Sonny was down for over 10 seconds. The fight was over. And boy, all hell broke loose then. There was a punch, and a hard punch that landed in a vulnerable place. There is footage that shows Liston's neck being snapped back by that punch. The thing that bothered me is Liston could take a hell of a punch. I'd seen him fight guys that were devastating punches. I've seen him fight those guys. I've seen those guys knock the daylights out of him for a while, but then he would always come on to knock them out. Ali hit him so fast. Ali really didn't know he hit him. But I took the mouthpiece out of Ali's mouth in that fight. And he told me, he said, he laid down. I said, no. I said, you hit him. So he asked me, he said, man, he, I think he laid. I said, no, man, you hit him. And it took a long time before he saw the punch that he hit Sonny with. What did you think of uh, the fight last night? I think it was a fake fight. Very fake. But what did you think of it? I thought it was a phony. Good mistake. The minute he hit the floor. I heard they said fix, and you could hear the ring. You hear the people hollering fix. I heard him say fix, fix, and he failed. I said get up, come on. I mean, I mean fix. I don't know about no fix. The story that I have got from various members of Sonny's camp was that two fellas did come up to training camp and represented themselves as black Muslims. They called on Sonny, and they spoke to him privately, and that they told Sonny that if he won the rematch. He was a dead man. Could that have happened? Sure. Should it have intimidated Sonny Liston? Why? Sonny Liston had the mob in his corner. He had come from a mob background. Why should he be afraid of a couple of well-dressed, in effect, mobsters who are threatening him? Sonny Liston was the most threatening guy around. We've learned that there very definitely had been a fix in that fight. Another guy who was very, very close to the mob in Chicago, a guy by the name of Bernie Glickman, was very, very close to Liston. And while he was conversing with Liston before the fight and with Geraldine, Geraldine said to Liston that as long as he had to dump the fight, don't take a chance of getting hurt. As long as you're going to lose anyhow, go ahead down, go down early. And of course, he went down in the first round. If he throw the fight, he went this great, he never told me. And if he threw it, I didn't see none of the money. I went in the back in the dressing room, and uh, he was all by himself. I said to him, I know how you feel. I've experienced this myself. 
But he didn't say one word. He didn't say anything. He just kept looking and looking. Because he had that mean look on his face. And I don't think he knew he had the mean look. But I kept on talking anyway. And finally I said, I don't think I'm reaching him. So I said, okay, I'll see you later. So I went to work out the door. And before I could get out to the door, he ran up and put his arms on my shoulder. I turned around. And he said, thanks. You know, then I knew then that I reached him. But Sonny was disgraced after the first clay fight. After the second one, boy, he, he really bottomed out. And everybody sort of expected him to just disappear. But Sonny did not disappear. Boxing was his livelihood. He hadn't made nearly as much money as one might suspect he had made. And he continued to fight on. We went to, to uh, Sweden. He did exhibition in Sweden. We traveled around and made a few dollars. And then after we came back, we moved to Las Vegas. Sonny fit in well in Las Vegas. You have to remember, you know, the gambling casinos were founded by gangsters. Sonny fit well into that picture. He wasn't harassed by the cops. People didn't care about his background. You know, he was comfortable there. Sonny slowly began rebuilding his career. Between 1966 and 69, fighting inferior opponents. He won 14 straight matches. One of his sparring partners was George Foreman, who was an Olympic champion at the time. Ironically, it was during this period that uh, Sonny's image began to soften. He landed uh, a movie role, some TV roles. Are you married? Married? Are you kidding? I can get any dame I want. All I have to do is to put out my hand and grab. Do you want any ice cream? Remember, there's an inherent beauty in soup cans that Michelangelo could not have imagined existed. Talkative Andy Warhol and Gabby Sonny Liston. Always fly Braniff. After Sonny moved to Vegas, he became more and more under the influence of Ash Resnick. He started hanging around with the wrong people. Friends of his were told by police out in Las Vegas that Sonny's hanging out with the wrong folks. There's a drug deal going down and Sonny's involved in it. There were all kinds of allegations as to what Sonny was doing. There were those that say he'd gone back to his old job as collecting debts for the mob. There were those that say he was pushing heroin. But uh, Sonny was pretty much just being Sonny Liston, doing the same kind of things, associating with the same kind of people he always had. There were the two faces of Sonny Liston. One of the faces was this man who was totally abstinent, perfectly well behaved, but around people that he ran with in the night, he behaved another way. There was a Jekyll and Hyde aspect to his personality. Any chance that Sonny had it? for another shot of the title was lost in 1969 after he was knocked out by uh, a former sparring partner, Leotis Martin. After that, Sonny had just one more fight. In June of 1970, he fought Chuck Wepner. He was known as the Bayonne Bleeder. It's a typical Wepner fight. He bled all over the place, and Sonny won on a TKO. Sonny was paid $13,000. Right away, he paid 10000 of that to repay a, a loan, and the other $3,000 he gave to his cornerman. He wound up with nothing, and he had nothing. He was At that point, he was just about broke. His wife, Geraldine, was out of town over the New Year holidays. She had tried to reach Sonny on the phone, but she couldn't get him. And she cut her holiday short because she was worried. She arrives in Las Vegas around 8.30, 8.45, and drives home. She pulls up to the house on Ottawa Drive, and she notices the lights are all out in the house. 
Well, I went in the back car porch, and I went through the few steps up, and it was a terrible.